And Terry, who we got on this call? All right. Um, all right. One of my friends from Spink Springfield, he comes to my men's nights. Um, he's actually very good friends with Anne Marie's husband. You ready for the numbers? Here we go. Um, kind um of Springfield Mike Schaefer. Yeah, like when you when you meet him, he just has a a certain he has a certain quirkiness Labor. to him. <laughs> Alright. Okay. Two and seven. Seven four one. Two one seven four one. Who gives out digits Two, one, like that? Seven seven four one. Oh, seven four one. What is this? Japan? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's this guy's name? His name is Josh. Should I do it, or are you just going to take over, you think? You do your best. All right, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's going to jump in eight seconds into the call. <laughs> oh, Josh. Hello. Welcome to the, the speech, guys. How you doing, man? Very good. How you doing tonight? Uh, you know, above average, below great, but we'll go with it, right? We'll take it right there. You are, um, least, I want to welcome you to the speech, guys. Awesome. Thank you, man. I am pleased to be here uh, with Ross and the other guys whose names I don't need to know because you're not as cool as Ross. Yep. That's fair. You we might not be as cool. Introduction, though. We not, might not be as cool, Josh, but we're definitely taller. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, man. It's all right. It took, Josh, it this took is, two episodes. Of this this is Mike, the eldest of the speech guys. Are you old enough to remember the Cold War as a first-person uh, individual? Yeah, I fought in it. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I played. I played, I played. I played. I played Rocky's son in Rocky Four, so that's how I sort oh. of contributed. Okay. Did you survive the Oregon Trail? Survive it. I built it. You built <laughs> You're the one to blame for the dysentery. Yeah. Josh, what do you do in Springfield other than harass Ross? Well, you know, uh, a little bit here and there. Uh, I work my job to pay my bills, and beyond that, uh, I try to live a hermetical life. And Ross tells me you listened to one of our episodes. Which one did you have the privilege of listening to? Uh, well, I listened to <clears> – <throat> excuse me here. I listened to uh, uh, part of the uh, – uh, the motherhood one. I, there's another one of those two right here a while back, but I cannot draw to mine, so I'm sorry that I can't answer those questions for you. Okay. But I do know the quality is outstanding. I do remember that. Hey, as long as you click play, we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you click play for yeah. at least five seconds, because that counts as a listen. Anything less was a waste. <laughs> you don't even have to have the volume on it, I don't think. No. I'm one of those guys, if I, I it's either I listen to a little bit of it, I'm like, nah, or I listen all the way through because, like, I've invested that much time in it, I might as well go the whole yard, right? What what other podcasts are you listening to these days, Josh? I generally don't listen to podcasts, ironically enough. I usually listen to radio. I'm old school. Hmm. What do you listen to on the radio? There's only two stations that matter. <laughs> Well, I, I, ironically enough, in my mature adulthood, I've listened to more of the Catholic radio station in town because I desire to educate myself in my faith so I can um, faithfully participate in it and uh, defend the doctrines. Uh, beyond that, really nothing much anymore. I really got disenchanted with rock stations after a while, but yeah. So. yeah. Well, you can add KMOX 1120 AM to that mix, and your life will improve several percentage points. <laughs> okay. If it's AM, it sounds much more legit. Because uh, I mean, like FM, it's, it's got the quality, it's got the sound, but like the AM, it's like it's like you're in radio because you want to be in radio, not because you you know you're looking for a job. Yeah, well said. You have some good competition here, but your your task is relatively simple. You need to introduce that this is season four of the Speech Guys. That we are doing the episode it titled. I don't know what's the title of the episode. All right. Hold so on, hold work. on. Josh, Ross is shortchanging you because he thinks you can't deliver. We like to get a little bit of razzle-dazzle, if you will, a little bling-bling, a little cheddar cheese from our uh, podcast introducers. 
what do you know about Goodwill Hunting? What do you know about Robin Williams? What do you know about Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and his little brother Casey in this film? Well, they're, well, as far as the latter three are concerned, they're all from Boston, so they uh, don't like to use the rhotic uh, accent of the English language. They like to diminish that R where it belongs and put an R where it doesn't. Um, as far as Robin Williams, he was a comedian who uh, tragically suffered with um, issues over the course of his life, but I think he contributed to side just the same. Uh, as far as the speech itself, you have my opinion on that? I'll give you my opinion on the speech. Yeah, what do you got? Okay, so my, my take from the speech is that it is a speech um, uh, articulating how experience trumps uh, book learning. Um, it is they're talking about how you, if you really want to learn about somebody else, you have to be vulnerable yourself to learn, right? Have, have you ever had the, the, the flavor of speech that uh, Doc gives Matt Damon there in your life? Some Some man who sort of – Trans transferring himself from middle age to later years with a beard who's just needs to sort of lay you down because you mocked his art and then smoked into it. Have you ever been I mean, in that I'm position before? I'm basically living Robin Williams' part right now, like you know, the middle aged man, like telling the younger folks what they need to do. Oh, okay. So as far, okay. As, as far as on the other end of it, though, as far as uh, learning what Matt Damon is learning, if you will. Uh, you know, I've had the fortunate um, experience of learning from good people. Uh, thank God, gently, you know, because we can all learn roughly in life, right? Like the, the hard thump that gets to the bottom of the well. Uh, but no, it's um, wait, what's what's at the bottom of the well? Like like a hard thump, man. If you like hit the bottom of the well, or you know, the, the bottom of the cliff, or whatever, you know, like it, the, the rough way of learning, you know, Le- learning life the hard way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry I'm, using, I'm using my colloquialisms here. I'm, I apologize. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm behind on my well references. <laughs> <laughs> I'll blame it on my mom being from Texas. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Okay. No, so, uh, yeah, at any rate, no, it's it's, um, it's fortunate when uh, you have guiding lights in your life that uh, be it somebody you know or somebody you don't know, somebody who takes notice and, you know, even if it's not the most pleasant or comfortable thing that they uh, – steer you the right direction because i mean i'd rather have a one moment of awkwardness and uncomfortable uh conversation than really geek things up later in my life right would would you say that choking the individual you have in therapy or counseling is sometimes necessary are you related to this person Is that rhetorical, or is that something to consider before you choke them? (laughs) (laughs) It really depends on the relationship. Uh, Okay, so you're saying it's an option. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I don't know what the the customary practices of the land are. You know, I mean, it could be very cultural, right? You sound like a lawyer on this side, Josh. You know, maybe, sort of, you know. (laughs) <laughs> oh, and that's why I am not. So, will this, will that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hey, Josh. Why don't you let us do the podcasting then? Why don't you introduce <laughs> us? <laughs> All right. This is season four of the Speech Guys podcast. You have Mike Landon and the wonderful Ross, and the episode is of the Park Bench speech from Goodwill Hunting. Please enjoy and let these guys dissect it. The Park Bench Speech. Well said. Yeah, that was good. I got the title. Thanks, Josh. (laughs) Thank you, Josh. You did great. All right. See you, bud. Take take care, guys. When you see the road. Uh, You know, Michael Schaefer, Ross Johnson. Matt Schultz and Landon Fry are all are all here. Yeah, free, free. <laughs> I've been back and I'm just gonna say it. I've been thinking it for ten minutes. I don't want to podcast here. Oh yeah. Now I've seen the road. Pregnancy is a beautiful thing. Pregnancy is a gift. There are stories to tell. Enough to get paint sticks to off. asteroids. Like, <laughs> yeah. if you don't climb your wall. Some days, but the lead us to a better place. We are called to emerge from 
that default setting of self-involvement. Okay, hell of a delivery by Josh. It's like he's been introducing podcasts since the Cold War. <laughs> Maybe before that. Ross, what do we got on the docket tonight? All right, so tonight we are on episode two of Oscar, what is it? Oscar-nominated films. Oscar, no, no. We're not a movie podcast. Okay. Os- speeches from Oscar-nominated speeches movies. Speeches from Oscar-nominated <laughs> movies. Yes. Yes. Um, so episode two. Got so right. we are gonna we're gonna dive into Goodwill Hunting. So I think before we really do anything, should we just listen to the speech? Yeah, we're we're calling this the Park Bench speech. Do you want to set up when the speech occurs in the film? For anybody that has not seen Goodwill Hunting, you have Matt Damon who plays a character who's a a young man that's kind of a math prodigy, but uh, doesn't come from a good social situation. So he's an orphan, uh, been in a lot of trouble, been arrested a lot, working just a low-paying, blue-collar job, but he's just math, absolute genius. So um, he, the math professor at MIT discovers him, wants to give him this opportunity to use his skills, but he has to agree to see a counselor because of his um, arrest issues. So we're sitting on a park bench. Robin Williams is a counselor. Um, might be a psychologist. I'm not exactly sure. But his so his task has been to help Matt Damon. Matt Damon has kind of just made a joke of everything so far. Um, so Robin Williams is kind of the first person to start peeling back the layers of Matt Damon a little bit to expose, um, yeah, I guess expose his weaknesses. Okay, let's take a listen. So what's this? A taste his choice moment between guys? This is really nice. You got a thing for swans? Is this like a fetish? It's something like maybe we need to devote some time to? Thought about what you said to me the other day about my painting. Huh. Stayed up half the night thinking about it. Something occurred to me. I fell into a deep, peaceful sleep and I haven't thought about you since. Do you know what occurred to me? No. You're just a kid. You don't have the faintest idea of what you're talking about. Why, thank you. It's all right. You've never been out of Boston. Nope. So if I asked you about art, you'd probably give me the skinny on every art book ever written. Michelangelo. I know a lot about him. Life's work, political aspirations, him and the Pope, sexual orientation, the whole works, right? I bet you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. You've never actually stood there and looked up at that beautiful ceiling. Seen that. If I ask you about women, Probably give me a syllabus of your personal favorites. You may have even been laid a few times. But you can't tell me what it feels like to wake up next to a woman and feel truly happy. You're a tough kid. I ask you about war, you'd probably uh, throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been near one. You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watch him gasp his last breath, looking to you for help. I ask you about love. Probably quote me a sonnet. But you've never looked at a woman and been totally vulnerable. Known someone that could level you with her eyes feeling like God put an angel on earth just for you. Who could rescue you from the depths of hell. And you wouldn't know what it's like to be her angel. To have that love for her be there forever. Through anything. Through cancer. And you wouldn't know about sleeping, sitting up in a hospital room for two months, holding her hand, 
because the doctors could see in your eyes that the terms visiting hours don't apply to you. You don't know about real loss, because that only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. I doubt you've ever dared to love anybody that much. I look at you, I don't see an intelligent, confident man. I see a cocky, scared, helpless <laughs> kid. But you're a genius, Will. No one denies that. No one could possibly understand the depths of you. But you presume to know everything about me because you saw a painting of mine. You ripped my <laughs> life apart. You're an orphan, right? Do you think I'd know the first thing about how hard your life has been? How you feel? Who you are? Because I read all of the twist. Does that encapsulate you? Personally, I don't give a shit about all that. Because you know what? I can't learn anything from you. I can't read in some book. Unless you want to talk about you. Who you are. And I'm fascinated. I'm in. But you don't want to do that, do you, sport? You're terrified of what you might say. You move, chief. <laughs> do you do you think a scene of his friend dying in his lap in war was a deleted scene from Good Morning in Vietnam, and this is actually a sequel to Good Morning in Vietnam. Ooh, I love uh, crossing the <laughs> character actor chasms of their other works. I feel like there's another one with Goodwill Hunting, but I don't know what it is. I think it's Ben, ben Affleck becomes an oil driller and flies to destroy an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> and matt damon is still the hated man in every movie because he's a genius no one likes and then matt damon had to out because he saw like hey ben went to space so now i'm i'm gonna go to space too and that's how he ended up on the planet in the other galaxy right in interstellar he he was the genius <laughs> sent on the lazarus missions yeah but yeah. So we have Good Morning <laughs> Vietnam, we have Armageddon, Goodwill Hunting, and Interstellar are all in the it's same multiverse universe. Universe, yeah. <laughs> same universe. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's funny. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, the park bench speech. Um, reason I chose the speech, I'd actually never seen Goodwill Hunting. Um, wow! Until yeah, like know. this topic. Yeah, until this topic. So well, that's I'm lovely. Lo- I'm looking That's through good... Osc- Oscar-nominated movies, and that one kind of jumped out. Um, I think I maybe found this speech, and I liked it, and I've just... Obviously, the movie's, like, really well acclaimed, and I kind of wanted to watch it, so... Um, so I'd never seen the movie before. Uh, first takes... I actually really liked the movie. It was good. I enjoyed it. Me and Julie watched it one evening. Nice. I really, I really like the speech. I kind of like the speech because I mean it fits like so well in the movie, and it's kind of this really important crux point for the Matt Damon character. But I just kind of like that. I feel like you could draw. I mean, understanding the movie helps a lot, but I feel like there's a lot of stuff in that speech that I mean you could not see the movie, and so I feel like gain a lot or have a lot of conversation topics just from the speech itself. First reactions from you guys, Mike. When did you first see it? Uh, it was not super long time ago, sometime in the past hmm, six years, I would say. Um, and I've probably <clears throat> I did rewatch it this past week. Um, and I've probably seen it. Uh, this was probably like the third or fourth time I'd seen it in the past six years. Um, what stuck out to me, well, in this this observation emerged in two layers so you know the speech opens this is basically this is well this is the second time that robin's character and matt's character are talking and meeting because the first instance was a week before a few days before whatever and 
Matt goes into Robin's office and he's 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 engaging with him as a therapist in the same way he engaged these other therapists, right? I'm going to find a way to break you, right? But in this very intelligent, sophist sort of way. And Robin Williams, instead of taking the bait, right, he's... He's he's going jab for jab. I love the one line where uh, he start talking about weightlifting, and Matt Damon asks how much he can bench press. And he says two eighty five, which I'm really curious if Robin Williams could bench that. It looks feasible. I mean, he's got his he's forearms got look pretty good. Yeah. To try to choke. yeah, when he choked yeah. Matt Damon, his forearm right. was pretty yeah. bulging. Yeah, um, but Matt didn't answer. And then, yeah, yeah, exactly. He obviously could bench 185 on a good day maybe and then matt damon finds a new thing he finds this little piece of art that looks homemade or something it's this sort of impressionist style little uh you know fishing boat type thing floating and he basically starts crapping on it and says it's no good and robin williams just acts like he doesn't care and and then obviously robin williams chokes him because of him um disgracing the memory of his uh his wife but the this speech of course opens with referencing him crapping on his art right yeah it and does. Uh, yeah what's what's the same about the other um therapists he saw is that Matt Damon mocked each of them and those therapists they couldn't they chose not to tolerate it and so they're like i'm not gonna work with this guy and robin williams was set apart because even though he was offended he saw matt damon's character's brokenness right the fact that he said those things because i mean he says because he's a kid but you can say because he's affected by sin like all of us and like that was the first step having compassion on him where Robin Williams could start really working with him, engaging him, right? And that stuck out to me because there's a lot of relevance to that, you know, as we've talked before in the podcast about my story writing with Mel and Grady and a couple of other things going on. It's there will be people who don't receive your art the way that you want them to right either it's ignored or they're sort of dismissive about it and it'd be very easy like these other therapists to just want to kind of put up a certain wall in those relationships or just put up a certain arm's length there but instead i think robin williams character miles as well seeing those individuals with compassion like they're broken people just like me i've let people down in presumably similar ways because of my sin and that compassion like allows that intimacy to persist despite being hurt i know there's a lot for a first reaction but it was sort it was just on my mind and it was my first <laughs> this was my first reaction my first reaction i probably i'd circle like i probably saw this 10 years ago definitely post college never seen it before then i don't know if i don't know what put it in front of us i'd credit logan i believe logan was like oh you've got to see that movie i would say let's call it 24 year old landon this movie would be like the represent the entirety of my knowledge of uh modern therapy and like what it is um i wouldn't have any other reference points besides like oh that's like what is in goodwill hunting um so i think just the introduction to psychology and therapy and uh probably probably seen it yeah somewhere between the four and six times since given it is a good watch and i'm more of a more of a repeat movie watcher than a new every single time I sit down movie watcher. Um, Mike, on your point of the 
how <clears throat> uh, Robin or Sean's character was different than the other therapists. I think one thing to add there would be he, yeah, Matt slash Will picked him apart, tried to break him down, um, and did break him down. But Sean was willing to, like, completely be vulnerable himself to Will back through the process. Not right off the bat. Like, he had to get Will to talk first and, like, get him going a little bit. But at the points where it was, like, here's me, what about you? Sean was always, like, lay it out. Like, in the end, discovered, like, both of their fathers beat him and, like, was willing to walk and share with him throughout the entire process, which I don't think the other therapists were. It was mostly a one-way dialogue. Um, and that's where, like, even Sean teaching his class of the community college students was, like, you know, how do you gain trust with your <clears throat> patients? Um, and that question wasn't answered in the community college class scene, but um, that was clearly the way he did it, was to offer himself... Yeah, I think briefly, there is a good modeling there in their interactions. Uh, you say vulnerability. I mean, you could say tenderness in his teaching, his formation, counseling, whatever. Yeah, yeah, choke, Which, choking your patient, today, like just so, that tender loving well, touch. Well, hold on. But <laughs> okay, with okay. our world, obviously... <laughs> okay, okay. Our world obviously emphasizes that aspect right, a lot, yeah. which is good and important. Yeah. But yeah, like you're saying, I mean, choking maybe too right. far. Josh is unsure, you know, maybe if you're related. Um, if your therapist isn't still, willing to chokehold you to get a point across, like <laughs> you're really not going deep enough. <laughs> but he does. But on the similar vein, you know, he does call him a cocky kid. The point is, like, he's coming from both directions. He's being appropriately harsh with him, right. but also tender at the same time, which is, yeah, I think probably if you saw the other counselors' long-term counseling careers, you know, they would probably lack that, that appropriate harshness. Um, and again, yeah, it's modeling a certain style of teaching that um, might be lacking in the modernity. The modernity. Or rea or reality, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Modernity. <laughs> I would lean towards modernity, but I was thinking the word just authentic, but it seemed like at least in the movie, like therapist seems like they were trying to approach it as, you know, not above, but trying to teach him or help him. There he's this project that they have, as opposed to Robin Williams was the person and I mean to kind of like Mike had said a little bit, like this idea that compassion, like he actually approached him as a as a person to kind of what both of you guys had said i mean i think that's kind of in any relationship just seems required like uh, or like that you have to in the movie you know matt damon was just smarter than everyone else so when someone tried to to be his teacher he was just smarter than everybody else so he could control the situation get the outcome that he wanted but robin williams was the first person who actually viewed him as a person not this this thing that they had studied which was the one area that Matt Damon was not comfortable in. And so, you know, I thought, like, just the his, the fact that his reaction wasn't even, like, it was just so, not blank, like, but just so, um, you know, he didn't fight back, he didn't cry, he just was just almost shocked uh, that, that, that that had happened. Might one say that in this speech, Sean, as Landon reminded us, the character's name is that Sean uh, portrays and communicates the distinction between book knowledge and experiential knowledge and that significance. Yeah, I wasn't quite ready to go there yet, but yeah, yeah. Are you sure? Oh, did you want to go somewhere else? It felt like a natural digression. So yeah, let's just go there. I mean, yeah, I thought there, what were you going with there, Mike? Why did, why did what we said trigger that thought? I mean, between the other counselors and between like the content of the speech itself, right? Because... The biggest chunk of Sean's speech is this 
casting of these different aspects of life. Love and art and war, other things, but you get the idea, right? And within each of these domains, he gives, he says, you know, Will, this is what you would say that war is or love is or art is. And obviously what Will was going to say, as we've already seen in other scenes, he's going to deliver some about something that he read in a book. Obviously what Sean eventually gets to later on is like, well, I mean, book knowledge is good, but Will is sort of twisting it as a defense mechanism, right? And so in the speech, Sean starts breaking it down in this just very articulate and specific way like he's he's going head on to like this is the kind of knowledge that you're lacking right now in your life because you're not being vulnerable and you're not allowing people to break through these walls right so it's like what's love love isn't just one night stands it's being with a woman who makes you truly happy I felt like that line could have been written better, but you get what he's getting at, <clears throat> yeah. right? I really, I really like the one with art, where it's not just the the history or the content of the art, but it's experience of it, ending up somehow in the Sistine Chapel and smelling it and bending your neck upwards and getting dizzy underneath it like the start. That would have been a better line. I should have been writing the dialogue for this, but I was ending the Cold War. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so that that's why I, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And, and the other counselors, of course, like they, they weren't able to break through for Will because they were they were just book smarts, right? Sean, Will was just able to outbook them. To <laughs> outbook them, yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh man, so that that's why that leads me to that thought. I think the whole idea of book knowledge versus versus experience. I don't know. To me, that was what probably from the whole beach jumped out to. Me. I mean, yeah, it's, it's the center. I mean, it is what the speech is about. But I think that made me think the most. And I think that's one thing that I maybe have shifted the last five to ten years. Like, not that I value yeah. the experience more. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I feel like it just draws you more deeply into life. Tangible things we can see, smell, taste, touch. Um yeah here if you want all the senses to get involved i guess but uh i think that and even like the whole idea of outsmarting somebody and like i like that he called him like a a scared a cocky scared let's kid little kid or whatever he called him because i think that was probably me for a while like i wanted to learn as much information as i could because i thought that would make me smart if that and you know I could be smarter than somebody else. When I think of moments that I really appreciate in my life that have produced joy or you know this gratitude or something that lasts outside of the moment itself, it's always these kind of experiential things that just draw you more right. deeply into you know that reality whatever. I think one area that I I that jumps out to me when I first think about it is just being married to somebody. Anything I say now I feel like I would have said the same things 10 years ago, you know, about what it, what it, what does it take to be a good husband or what does it take to be a good father? What I would have, how I would have said those things 10 years ago would have been in a very romanticized way. You know, I'm going to sacrifice my wife and be willing to stay up late and help with the baby and just like all these things that, you know, we, I think we would all agree like a good guy should do, but just having like lived through some of that and having to, to actually, you know, be in the trenches, if you will. I think it just makes you appreciate it that much more, I guess. And then I think that, so it's not that I have like new book knowledge, but it just like makes the book knowledge sink in so much you can, it's like into the your bones, you know, it's not just in your head anymore. What you just gave is a description of <clears throat> fatherhood and being a good husband through fatherhood. I've really never been exposed to a book on that. Mm-hmm. It's called the Bible, Landon. Maybe open it. Remember, <laughs> keep studying. That's fair. That's fair. But 
Well, I, I don't know. I used... yeah, fine, but, I mean, you fine. You can say things like Art of Manliness, Wild at Heart. I mean, those are those are books about being a dad. Yeah. I yeah, guess it's yeah, it's yeah. knowing it at the the cognitive level versus having lived through right. it just changes how That's you think fair. about it. Not, I shouldn't even say it, it doesn't change how yeah. you think about it. it just changes Which how you maybe know it. is why like I feel like there's no book on it because like I've lived it. And I don't feel like I've read or been prepared fully for it. Now having experienced some of it, given I don't think that you're being as um fair with yourself as you ought to be because yeah i mean i don't know if you've read wild at heart but i did you've read I other did. books I've read like, wild. you did okay I've, I've read the bible and we've you've obviously read our main right Art. so yeah right it's like all of those things all of that content that <clears throat> you consume i mean how i think about it in this sort of like meta way is like those are things that create the expectations within yourself. Yeah. They they create the expectations for your soul, if you will. And if you're not reading those things before it really hits the fan, when you have to wake up in the middle of the night, you're not gonna do it. Because it's like, well, who care? I mean, you people mo usually aren't gonna be that dismissive about it. They'll put up like some fight, but they're going to give up a lot more right. easily versus in, in our minds, but you guys, cause you're actually in it. It's like, no, I can't fail. And this is going to sound silly, but I think there's a lot to this because I can't let Brett McKay down or John Eldridge down or all of these, these ghosts, if you will, in our soul that we want to live up to. Seeing analyzing this book versus experience, part of the scene, like seeing Sean Robbins library, like, you know, <clears throat> Matt Will was impressed. Like, oh, I've read those books. Oh, interesting books, etc. Like, do you, does it make you want to like, oh, I need to read more books or I need to experience more of life? Which, which way do you fall there? Well, well, I think it just very obviously Will didn't need the books. He needed the nature of life and to be bold and vulnerable like right. communicating yeah, to yeah, him yeah. right mm -hmm. to be a witness for other people it's like yeah they they do need the books they do need to believe that there is more than the five senses yeah. right that the senses have a sacramental nature to them right which is sort of where the books come from be able to enter as deeply into the experience if i didn't understand it to some level, the importance of it. Part of why it's, I don't want to say easy, easier to do the hard things to really, especially like the, the things that maybe involve some suffering, which we can get to, but, you know, to run with our example of being married and having kids, like really entering fully into that experience, even the, yeah, the joys of it and the awesome parts, but also the really hard parts. Like if you don't understand why it's as important as it is, you know, why it has literally, you know, eternal consequences for all of us involved. I don't think you will approach it the same way. And I think that will, you'll kind of withdraw. You won't enter in. And I think that's why you get people that are, why people view it as this boring domestic thing that they, you know, have to put up with. I don't, I, we didn't talk about it in the outline, but I feel like it's worth mentioning just what social media and the internet does to, to that. And I think from two standpoints, and I'll, the first one I'll say first because it's more of a soapbox, but the second one I'll say because I think it's better for discussion, but there's this Facebook thing, which I'm not looking at Facebook right now, which is probably good, but that it's called, I f***ing love science. And people put it and they post it and like, I shouldn't get upset about it. I should be like Robin Williams and see that these people are probably hurting somewhere and blah, blah, blah. But like, and I'm, if people like it, I'm sorry, but the people that I see posted, it's just like so obvious that they're trying to be condescending to other people. And it's like, you're just posting a, a picture of something that someone else figured out that you found mildly interesting. That's all that just happened. Talk about stuck in the book knowledge only realm. You know, they just don't have the intellect that Matt Damon's character does. But um, I think, a, I mean, I think a better kind of way to talk about though is just, 
just this idea of kind of living more virtually. And I feel like how that I would have to think just det- detracts from a full experience. Books versus experiences. One thing, one trend that I've noticed from a few writers or pseudo modern day philosophers that I follow um, and have followed the last five to 10 years is they're actually coming around to like whatever their mid twenties. It was like, read as many of the best books, check them off. Oh, I'm trying to read 50, 60 books this year, maybe a hundred and like take notes and I can do several thousand books in a lifetime. Um, and then even like, there's a famous video, Carl Sagan, who did, um, um, kind of the Neil deGrasse Tyson of the 1970s and 80s. Uh, he was in a well. In in fairness to Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson did the Carl <laughs> Sagan. <laughs> Fair, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> okay, same character. There's a bit of a viral video of him in a big library, and he's like, even the smartest person, like if they're actually taking in the knowledge, like call it one or two thousand books, and he walks down like three or four shelves of a library, and he's like this is all they're going to be able to read in their lifetime. Like for you or whatever, whoever you are, like figure out what your specialty, you know, calling will is. And like, you've got to like be conscientious of the way that you spend your time reading books. Like don't read the hottest thing off the shelf, like commit to something to chip away at. Um, Back to my modern writers, readers, Like, they're even, like, just as I mentioned, I only watch, I prefer to watch movies four, five, six times and then, like, catch the new thing. I've noticed, like, even even some of these guys all throughout David Perel, you can look them up, um, is just, like, read the same one, two, three, five books, maybe five writers, and, like, know everything about them about it it's better to like ponder deeply the best works than to try to like carry the breadth of everything um and so personally that's kind of how i've thought about my own reading and books and pursuit of knowledge recently um i think with like just quickly offhand with social media is like books or experiences so much of what we're inundated with and presented to consume is like neither it's like not real knowledge it's not art or science or yeah source material and it is all just like a distraction and um you just even now have to like so conscientiously choose to pursue experiences or actual reading in it I think the most relevant connection with the film, you know, Will makes a reference to the books on Sean's shelf in something to the effect of, like, did you actually read them or are they just there to make you look smart? He didn't use those words, but it was something to that effect, right? And I think that the books on the shelf to make you look smart, I know people still do that to some extent, but... That was... I have lots of books on my shelf just to look smart. <laughs> Guilty. Shame on you, Landon. <laughs> he has his hand up. I think that was the great-looking Instagram post with science being awesome and, you know, free Palestine. Infin- Infinite Jest? Oh, yeah, I've read Infinite Jest. Look, it's right yeah. there on my shelf. In the free <laughs> Palestine banner on your Facebook <laughs> profile and all these things. But the point is, is that, like, it was difficult to brand yourself before social media. Oh, yeah. And, like, what even, yeah. what even is a brand? Like, if you were just to dial into evolution just raw nuts and bolts humanity like what's the what's the analog version of brand i it's not obvious to me um but that's what social media allows which like Lennon said is an utter distraction from both like book and experience knowledge which we're agreeing like you definitely need both will needed more experience knowledge and 
other people need more book knowledge and like the branding just takes you away from ed both of those <laughs> i do admit like so. whether friends family maybe you <clears throat> I will, if I go into somebody's house and like, <clears throat> I'll act like Will staring at their bookshelf for a bit, just to like be, you know, they've got their books out, they're displaying them, you know, see if they've read them, kind of throw a few jabs and, yeah. and it is, it is, I don't know, it's a prior, prior generations way to like say who they are and i think it's an important lost art to confront them on it i'm not crapping on it completely i'm just i mean it's nice it's fun to look at yeah 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 but to be like call out whoever's house you're in like maybe you don't even know the host that well but yeah pick something off the shelf and you can yeah. keep your books landing, okay? no i'm just saying it's uh it's a lost art that i think we should carry on right and i think we'd all agree like there's a difference between like having books in your home where people may or may not come versus like publicly portraying it you know on some internet forum where, right yeah right, not, in, in this, order yeah, yeah this doesn't have to do with social but media. um yeah. yeah one thing that i think is worth talking about when we say experiences because as we've been talking it's like i and it, i think it ties into risk taking which i think was in the outline quite a bit but I think people can hear this and I think we talked about it a long time ago. This might have been pre actual aired podcast age, but the man in the arena and yeah. I think we talked about yeah. how I think that was our <laughs> first ever podcast. Stuck with me. Technically um, in in that <laughs> McDonald's parking lot for me. <laughs> but we talked I think Landon you mentioned how like a lot of people use that as an argument for like doing these tech startups and things like that. But that was like years ago. So maybe things are changed, but I think to the same idea or the same feeling people can hear, or even we can hear this idea of experience and picture very grand things. So there's a flavor of the, yeah, I'm not going to, I, I'm not going to, you know, settle for this boring life. I want to experience everything and I want to travel and I don't want to settle down yet. And I don't know if you guys get what I'm going here at all, but, and even though I think that can be part of experience, so I'm not trying to say that's bad necessarily. I think right. a big lost point of that is just the when we say experience, like, and I like, so that's why I like how Sean, you know, he, what he talks about aren't these grand, really on their face. I mean, I guess in a way romantic, but the, they're not these grand special things, right? Holding your wife's hand as she dies of cancer, I guess going to Sistine Chapel is pretty, pretty grand, but you know, having your friend die in your lap during war. Um, but I think the, a, a good example of it was when he talks about how, Matt Damon's character that is he you know his wife farted in her sleep yeah 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 mm -hmm. which I think was kind of like a chuckle moment and but I think it sh it shows that when we talk about experience it's not just these huge grand things it can be these very seemingly simple you know just ordinary basic things but entered into fully those are the experiences that help probably teach us the most about life. I thought you were going to go a slightly different direction with that. Um, and may, well, maybe part of this is because this was brought up on the outline. I thought you were going to say like, how is the element of risk considered as an important aspect of life experience, you know, as something to be learned from? Um, right, because one one could delude themselves to some extent that you're experiencing life simply because you're paragliding in Belize or something like that on a regular basis, which is fun. And like you're saying, it's not, not 
saying you can't do those things, but it is important to consider what ways can I live dangerously in a sense, because those are, those are the things that Sean is touching on in this speech, like ways to live dangerously and with risk that, um, these challenging will to consider. When we're talking experience, just, I think risk is a necessary component, whether it be, you know, this, I don't want to say superficial because you could die hang gliding in Belize, but you risk something. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we can jump with that in all we want. Yeah. I mean, I like, and I'll give Matt credit, even though I said I was going to take credit (laughs) from this. He said, um, he says there is a connection here between suffering or between risk and suffering. Risk implies the willingness to suffer. Um, yeah, I thought that was a striking thing to observe and seemed seemed accurate. And maybe we can uh, distill something there on the people of modernity. <laughs> why did Why did you specifically say? From people of modernity with that um do we in modern in modern and modern I day, might not have do we no. take as kidding, many sorry. do we take as many risks as we should um what ways do we tend to avoid risk are there ways that back in the day they actually maybe took less risks than we do now in certain ways And what do you guys think of that connection between Matt saying there between uh, risk and suffering? Top of mind, right off the bat, I do think we are um, faced with less risk. Like looking at the 18, 19 year old in society, especially. I feel like many of the public data charts I've seen, like teens, especially maybe a generation behind us, like do less drugs, less confronted with things of adulthood and kind of just delay that because they're all looking at their phones all the time. We don't have to fight in wars. Time to marriage has generally on average dropped back many years since the prior one or two generations. Taking a leap of faith or, you know, our parents got married at age 22 or getting married at age 30, 32, feeling the need to like have everything secured, like a safe job, a bunch of savings in the bank before taking a risk in, yeah, committing to something lifelong without optionality is where we're probably taking fewer risks. Yeah, I mean, I think just our whole modern climate controlled 72 degree everything is super comfortable seems to be very averse to risk taking. It seems like kind of an adolescent mindset to like want risk for the sake of risk. I feel like as an adult, you have to, I mean, yeah. So we'll, well, to riff off Matt's point, I do agree. I think risk implies the willingness to suffer because you have to leave yourself open to that possibility, right? Cause a risk kind of implies that something bad could happen. When we're teenagers, risk for the sake of risk seems cool. So I'm picturing kids driving their cars really fast, doing drugs because their parents told them not to, or drinking beers because their parents told them not to, whatever, like whatever, you know, insert high school movie you want to talk about. But I think as an adult, you have to, eventually you ha- any sort of commitment you're ever going to make has to have some sort of risk attached to it. And... I mean, I've used my analogy before, I feel like, on this podcast and elsewhere about how I feel like when, you know, proposing to Julie in some ways is like jumping off a cliff. Like, it's one of the biggest risks you'll ever take. Does anybody have a thought of a risk that doesn't... So we've talked about marriage a lot, but, like, does anybody have thoughts? Like, what else... What other, I guess, positive risks are there? Um, I mean, what are you looking for? Things like new sure. jobs or sure. like jobs new is second, religions. yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah, and not just book knowledge. Um, Talk, give us an experience I, here. What have we done here? I mean, I think that something relevant to what we're saying here, coming from the other direction, you know, why do and of course, the elephant in the room, of course, is Mike, who's. 35 and not married just commenting on the reality of 
lack of uh, risk taking, at least from the standpoint of of marriage or long term relationships. Coming at it from the other angle, you know, we are obviously well aware of people like helicopter parents. <clears throat> There's a friend of mine. He was talking about how his his uh well I won't say this yeah I mean we're obviously very protected from any sort of harm harm is, is of course in quotes um, because how much actual harm uh, even is there but um yeah I'm trying to think of any other example you know drinking bottled water constantly stuff like that but I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is like could even simply the 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 proverbial helicopter parent who's not saying anything about risk to a child but just simply protecting them tremendously from any discomfort does that in a way um train them in not taking risks right it's not directly linked to not taking risks but it does make you fearful of discomfort which it doesn't take too much um, brain activity to consider a risk and then realize, oh, this might be uncomfortable. Hey, don't beat yourself up. Lincoln didn't get married till 33. I was, oh, damn it. I thought he was older than that. No, 33. <laughs> that's like 50. Life expectancy. In today's years. Life expectancy for them, for males in 1842, was about 45. So. And yeah. with how many miles yeah. you can run, you're going to live yeah. to at least 150. You thought he was just... <laughs> <laughs> I think the parenting thing, this is not in the outline, but just interesting. I think I could do a better job at that because to kind of, I guess, challenge myself based on everything I've said so far, like I kind of earlier kind of broke down. It's not just the grand experiences. It's kind of those simple everyday things that are, you know, real life. I think sometimes I struggle, like I flip it with my kids. Like I try to give them these big experiences where they can take a risk or be uncomfortable, but like every day of life, I think I take, I don't do that well enough. Well, what are some examples of ways? So like on the grand experience, like are these big things like to, you know, I feel like I try to, I try to rely on these big moments. So like last weekend we had our Cub Scout camp out. It was cold outside. It was like the lowest 34 degrees. So I took the, so me and Thomas and Benjamin slept outside in the tent. To most people, I feel like sleeping outside in 34 degree weather sounds pretty crazy. Um, and yeah, so Benjamin is three and he's now done it. So to, so like I have that, but I feel like sometimes in the day to day, you know, I can't think of a super, I mean, just to try to collectively talk about it, you know, uh, you know, don't climb too high on the jungle gym or, you know, you scraped your knee, let's get the Neosporin and the Band-Aid. And not that those are bad things to say at all, but I feel like I probably err on the side of slightly over protective on those type of things. And then I kind of get these grand images in my mind of, you know, these 34 degree, these cold weather campouts or something. But I feel like those day-to-day things probably have just as much impact on them. Well, in fairness to you, you know, the 34-degree camping, there there are very few parents, I feel like, who would do that with a child, yeah. little alone a three-year-old. Which is great, because you recognize, like, you just bring plenty of blankets and you'll be perfectly fine and they're going to have a great time. Yeah. Oddly enough, over half of the people camped inside yeah. the church. But it's like, I don't know. I, I think you're being too hard on yourself with the jungle gym and putting Neosporin on things like, well, infections are real risks. <laughs> and falling off and breaking your neck is real. But, you know, if the risk is, oh, maybe, so are they really ready to take off their training wheels on their bike? Like, mm, maybe not but you know what he or she really wants to do it and i think there's an opportunity to learn consequences here they're not gonna die i mean almost impossible they're gonna die but is there a real risk they might sprain a wrist or something like that like i don't know i think that's sort of like the the more middling appropriate sort of 
uh, routes, yeah, to consider there. I tell, I say this jokingly. I do think I say this as a joke, but tell. So the unmarried guy uses the now uses the argument. Well, they're not gonna die. It's like try telling that to my wife, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you know men and women balance each other out. You know, but couple thoughts. I do think looking at the text, looking at the speech series of speeches that we're analyzing. The biggest risks are probably for a man, perhaps looking at the Goodwill hunting narrative in light of what is positive or toxic masculinity. The biggest risk for a man is being vulnerable enough for the relational marital risk leap of faith discussion because he does not figure that out until the very last scene. That is the last thing he was able to do. That is, it took all of therapy, it took all of the routing, and it wasn't until cut away that he's finally going to get her to go see about a woman. So, do you think that's number one? The second reason I think that is because I think that actually my favorite scene or speech in this movie is the construction parking lot scene between Ben and Matt or Will and whatever Ben's character's name is. Um, I think that even the first time I watched that movie, this movie, and today I'm still very conflicted by the message. Um, and the... the Maybe, hey, why don't... Why don't we pause and take a listen oh. to that? All right, we'll Double take a listen. Speeches. Bonus, bonus speech. So how's your lady? Ah, she's gone. Gone, gone where? Uh, med school, medical school in California. Really? Yeah. What was this? It's like a week ago. Well, that sucks. So, uh, when are you done with those meetings? I think the week after I'm 21. Yeah, they gonna hook you up with a job or what? Yeah. Sit in a room and do long division for the next 50 years. Yeah. Probably make some nice bank, though. We a lab right Better than Way out of here. I want a way out of here for I mean, I'm gonna fucking live here the rest of my life. You know, be neighbors, you know, we'll have little kids. Take them a little league together up fully failed. Look, you're my best friend, so don't take this the wrong way. In 20 years, if you're still living here, coming over to my house to watch the Patriots game, still working construction, I'll kill you. That's not a threat, what? that's a fact. I'll kill you. What are you talking about? Look, you got something none of us. Oh, come on. Why, why is it always this? I mean, I've owe it to myself to do this or that. What if I don't no, want to? No, no, no. You, you don't owe it to yourself. You owe it to me. Because tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'll be 50. And I'll still be doing it. And that's all right. That's fine. I mean, you're sitting on a winning lottery ticket. You're too much of a cash it in. And that's bull****. Because I'd do anything to have what you got. So would any of be an insult to us if you're still here in 20 years. Hanging around here is a waste of your time. You don't know that. I don't? No. You don't know that. Oh, I don't know that. Let me tell you what I do. But every day I come by your house and I pick you up. And we go out, we have a few drinks and a few laughs and it's great. You know what the best part of my day is? For about 10 seconds from when I pull up to the curb and when I get to your door. Because I think maybe I'll get up there and I'll knock on the door and you won't be there. No goodbye, no see you later, no nothing. I'm just left. I don't know much, but I know that. I am conflicted by this speech. And this is the job speech. So I just said, marriage is number one for a guy. Matt didn't figure out the last scene. That's her proof in this text. Second is job, career. Where are you willing to take a risk? It's even the my favorite, the, the true, the Gospel of Jordan Peterson, original lecture series, 
lecture two, Abraham finally leaves his father and he sets out to found the nations. He follow, He's the only one who follows and walks with God and, and he leaves and he goes west, young man, right, to Egypt. He doesn't know what he's doing, um, but he does leave and try to become something for himself, which is like the thesis of the west, um, secular and religious, perhaps. That, that scene that we just listened to, the construction scene, is a version of that. Um, and, and perhaps Ben is right, like, go west, Matt, leave. You need to grow up, use your talents, forget about me, never talk to me again. I, I don't know, you contrast that with, like, community, like, people are more important than the chase for career and like relationships and perhaps like add in some like a spice of Wendell Berry, like being in a place and knowing a place and um yeah being with people who are you know of different intelligent capacities is is a form of diversity perhaps um and there's a lot he can offer to where he is from um, so I, I, I disagree perhaps with some parts of that scene and I don't know, feel conflicted by, it. I think it's a, it's a very interesting dialogue that describes a lot of Western psychology that is hard to sometimes square up with, um, Christian theology. How did that connect with our previous thing? So one, one, taking a risk, taking a risk. Yeah. Uh, first, I believe is is marriage and relationship. Two is job and career. And my question would be like, maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. Like, it's not the. I don't think it's as it's as morally or. I don't think the job risk is as important as this scene makes it out to be as perhaps even Western yeah. canon yeah. makes it out to be. Yeah. I mean, I'm not too put off by that scene. I, there's certainly a spectrum I'd say. I mean, it's in the past I would have said differently. Um, I don't think that you one is morally required, compelled to like stay friends like we've stayed friends uh i think there is a moral compulsion for some connection if you were actually friends with them like something once a year once every few years somewhere in there um so yeah i just say that i mean a little bit of a little bit of a spectrum there but yeah he's obviously not embraced sean or no i need i need the, i need uh, black and white either they Stay in Boston and do T-ball together and her neighbors, or they never talk to each other again. Like, what? Which one is the right answer here? They found face. He found Facebook and he contacted him. <laughs> this is Will. You remember me? I feel like so. You said job was to. To me, yeah. I would put where you live. And like leaving a place, and and I think they're fair. a little That's bit fair. they're similar, yeah. Because like, yeah. so I'm thinking about so to try to kind of get as like big picture as possible. Like, you can contrast in the Bible, like honor your father and mother, and you know leave them and be joined to your wife. So there does seem to be almost like a. I'm not saying there actually is when lived well, but I feel like there's a, you could say that there's a feeling of like a tension there. Like, which one am I supposed to do? Cause in a lot of times it seems like they would be kind of a, I have to pick one or the other. Um, and I think that's actually an interesting thing because I feel like, and maybe this is just like different cultures were value different things, but, you, the whole like leaving home seems like a very hard thing to do. So like when you were talking about Abraham, you know, I started thinking about, I mean, I only live 28 minutes from the house I grew up in. So like, am I, 
I started like second guessing myself in a you're, way. You're, it's closer than that. He's one conference team over. It's closer than 20 minutes. <laughs> Same newspaper is going to write about us. But, um, but like in all like seriousness, like I feel like I started even thinking about like, oh, did I take the the safe route? You know, did I not take the risk to to move away from home and, you know, make my own make my own place, but then I contrast that with, like, you know, how much we would, you know, It's a Wonderful Life, like George Bailey. Like, well, he lived in the same town he grew up in, took over his father's business, and we would all view that as, like, a really good life. So that's just, like, I, I, I feel like that's kind of a fun little mind game to play with on which which side to fall on. I did think Matt Damon was a little harsh, like, but... The best ten minutes of my day, or when I think you might not be there. It's like, I don't know. Does does Ben Affleck? Oh ben yeah, Affleck sorry. Ben that Affleck said that's Matt Damon. Correct. But yeah, he should want Matt to do more than a construction job, right? Um, to make it more f- interesting. But like, I'm I'm exaggerating some parts here. To as he said, like I never want to see you again. If that means that you pursued the fullest of your talents versus not which i think is a you know uh, a microscopic view of the dichotomy of the two options here but in the least that's my favorite scene and one that uh made me ponder the most of the trade-offs of of risks and life choices so in the movie i mean when he goes west go west young man like he's obviously chasing the girl I feel like, and that specific, I mean, it's a fictional movie, but like if you have, if you're that much of a math genius, like, I mean, you're going to have a job, right? It's not like you're giving up a right. job. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to yeah, work at right. MIT. I can work at Stanford yeah. though. So like, you know, woohoo. Have you guys ever felt like you've had to do something? I mean, what risks have you taken or what, and not, or, or not taken? You know what I mean? Like what? At what at what junctures did you kind of have sort of a uh, these difficult decisions where you had to play these, you know, factor in all these things we're talking about? You know, it's it's not as if all risks are created equally, at least on in our own minds, right? I remember hearing, I think it was on Joe Rogan at one point this anecdote of some you know stud boxer or something who uh had to call a buddy of his to stand up to this guy who's trying to scam him at his house who's trying to sell him something right and obviously this boxer could have kicked this scam guy's butt unfazed right um but like this boxer just had never learned how to challenge himself and sort of navigate that uncertainty of standing up to someone who's trying to lie to you or swindle you. So I sort of set that up as a prologue to what I'm going to share. It's like, yeah, in certain ways, I think that taking risks, sort of wading out into the unknown comes fairly... I would easily is not the right word because even for this like boxer, like it's not easy to go in the ring and, you know, kick someone's butt or vice versa. And so with like things in my life, there's certain risks or challenges or uncertainties, which come more naturally. I'd I I would say it's, you know, with things that we talked about with, long distance running or cycling 300 miles or a thousand miles you know i know ross wants to talk about romance it's like it's it's relatively easy for me to just ask a random girl on a date i mean i could fill a book uh, about stories like that my cousin you were shaking in your boots after lana's wedding no asking that girl on a date (laughs) about tears (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I got her number. He did get her number, though. Um, Yeah, my cousin, Josh, not the one who introduced this episode. He said that 
my love life could be an episode of modern love (laughs) or a whole season maybe yeah that that comes like fairly easily to me um but in fairness but but on the other side of it that i'm trying to stick with the uh the click words from the speech It's like with me risk asking a girl on a date. It's like whatever she turns me down. Like mostly the harm is on me. Like I'm not gonna hurt her, right? And I I would say that the longer I'm in a relationship, obviously emotions become more complicated. Of concerns of hurting another person hurting yourself because oh boy no my life would have been better if i stayed with her or you know or not staying with her um of course there are actual factors that one is dealing with too um it's not just all in your head it's like yeah where where do i necessarily fall on that spectrum of of navigating that sense of risk in relationships. I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll sort of repeat something vaguely of where it feels like I've been at, at that edge, if you will, with a couple of girls, a few girls, where it's like, man, really wish that would have worked out. I like there's nothing like inherently scary to me about marriage right but it's with these other girls where it's like man i don't know if i could do a whole life like that i think that's appropriately vague but factual at the same time so that's my experience how much that tracks with other people's I don't know. Honestly, I don't feel like that tracks super closely to other people's experience of risk and commitment in relationships, but I'm open to being proved wrong. <clears throat> yeah, bringing it, bringing it down one level to the personal. I went to see about a girl in Chicago and went to the north side of Illinois. You know, I didn't, I didn't cross state lines, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Um, Turning on filter to Christian <laughs> Mean Gold. <laughs> um, I think there is. I th- think that I'd probably. Somewhere in our notes, we said that the review of Goodwill Hunting was like, it's so predictable. Um, and. And he did go west. He did go see about the girl. He did pursue the fulfillment of his potential. Um, And I think that is both the cultural current we swim in. That is both um, Western and Christian. Both, uh, yeah, I I think it is the Abraham story. Uh, Leave leave your father's house and like see see where god is taking you um as well as perhaps just the more like go succeed and achieve and and i think those are both true having still an interest in just that scene with ben being off and me questioning if that's true for everybody like, had he stayed, that would have been a less predictable story. But I think you can make enough arguments that it would be equally as admirable. But you'd only have to use... I think you'd have to only use Christian themes to make that as equally as admirable and less capitalistic pursuit of greatness themes i I think really quickly i don't think you'd necessarily have to use explicitly christian themes but in order to know if the movie had a happy ending you would have to see what happened over the next 60 years fair okay that's fair yeah 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 all right sure i mean my last thought on the risk thing i feel like the risk 
even when we talk about all of them, is just commitment. So, like, you just risk it not being what you wanted it to be. But if you're committed, there's not really a way out, if that makes sense. So, um, like, you know, with romance, like, there's a risk that, you know, she doesn't make me as happy as I thought she would, or she looks different than she used to, or, you know, this isn't exci- as exciting as it used to be, but there's not, like, you know, I think Matt had put, or we we put in, like, the discussion points, you know, like, in some ways, marriage is the most risky thing you can possibly do, and then I, unless, you know, divorce is just super commonplace and normal and not a problem, because if you don't like it, you just get out of it, so it's not risky in that sense, so... I feel like it's more the this idea of a commitment you have to make that's risky, whether that be this person I'm committing myself to for the rest of my life, this job, this place of living, like whatever it may be. Final bell. Final bell. All your strength, all your power, all your love. What round is it? 15. One more round. There's no stopping this now. This is our round. And we're back. Woo we we've been sitting on this park bench with Sean and Will for way too long. The sun's getting real low and the ducks have eaten all of our bread. Ross, what do we got for the uh, final bell here? All right, so we've talked about Matt and Ben a lot. We've talked about experience instead of our book knowledge. We've talked about risks with vulnerability. How, what are we supposed to do to be successful? All this stuff. What is something that you had to learn by experience? Or something that you thought you knew, but experience somehow changed your perspective or how you looked at it? So since I am of the three who had the most inclination for something on this one, I'll lead the way. Maybe something will strike them as I go. Um, Yeah, something, and I've sort of commented on this before in similar ways, but I don't know. Maybe this will uh, will land in a more compelling way for for, uh, someone on their drive right now. Um, Something in, in the arena of faith here um would be my answer um you know we well i mean me and ross you know we're around the newman center catholic community landing landing his own uh christian communities to uh be a part of in college right and as as one should be you know one be, can become very fired up by that environment all these new think great things you're learning about your faith and great people you're around and et cetera, et cetera. And like that's, yeah, you know, call, call that book knowledge in a sense. But one, but everyone has to go about this in a different way. One does have to reckon themselves with certain hard questions, right? And um, in, in all, of, I don't, yeah, I've talked about this with my, my mom recently. Um, you know, for some reason, when I was in college, it didn't bother me as much. I don't, I don't know why, but the um, Catholic priest sexual abuse scandal, like it bothers me now a lot more than it did then. Yeah, and I'll just without dwelling it too long, all I'll say else on is it's less that it. It happened. I mean, obviously, it's tragic it happened, but the fact that it was covered up so frequently. Yeah, dealing with that as a hard question. And then, as I've shared before, you know, watching um, my grandpa um, uh, degrade, slow down with his dementia. Yeah, and just considering, you know, as I've said before, but it's a very, I think, useful and apt analogy. There's something that is more coherent, spiritually coherent, about suffering to your death with cancer. Because generally speaking, I know it's not all the time, you can still sort of lose lose your mind at certain points of suffering from cancer. 
But but at the same time, yeah, your mind and your will is there, and you can potentially repent of whatever things you might have done or something, right? But with dementia, if you're like, you're presumably losing that that nimbleness with your mind and your will so where's where's your capacity to repent right through that and it's over the course of years it's not like it is over the course of just a few hours yeah dealing with those two things because i mean not to build myself up but those are like reasonable things that a lot of people and a lot of people do. Like, I'm sure there are a lot of people who have those two big things on their minds. And it's like, I'm not screwing around with Christianity or even more draconian Catholicism's flavor. Um, but there's two things that that life experience sort of coalesced for me from those two experiences in um one is having to do with the dementia experience is tied to something from john chapter six where jesus gives his eucharistic discourse and um turns to peter and asks you know are you gonna leave me too and peter says to whom else shall we go right and you know, there was something that was absurd about the Eucharistic discourse, right? That's why everyone left, because they're like, this is crazy. This doesn't make sense. And that's like the dementia for me. It doesn't make sense. It's absurd is in a certain sense. And Peter, in rather being in this sort of goofy, sort of zealous way, like, well, you know, Jesus, you know, he doesn't like give Jesus uh, a great Christian meme back at him, right? It's it's this very material and deep recall of their friendships. Like, well, to whom else shall we go? Like, you are the only thing that speaks the words that have anything to do with eternal life, right? Something about that make a lot of sense for me. I heard that gospel reading like probably a few weeks before something very significant happened with my grandpa. And that's that's why I got this tattoo to sort of etch that that realization in my mind and heart. The other thing with the priest, um, and this is actually sort of just recently, but realizing that it really comes down to one thing. Did Jesus rise from the dead or not? Like, that's it. It's still inexplicable how, you know, priests could have abused children this way or how it could have been covered up, but that's the thing. That's the only question that really needs to be answered. So those are things that life taught me or sort of shaped what I learned in books. I'll go next. I've got a thing or two. Um as far as what have I learned from experience. And I think it's the first thing that comes to my mind is just how much I can learn from other people. And I know it sounds like an obvious thing, but like when I think of how I learned it from experience, I think at one, at some point I thought certain people could teach me things, if that makes sense. So, you know, these people that have read these books or, my mom and dad or these people that, you know, are living well, these values that I say I should live out, all blah, blah, blah. But I think that as I've gotten to know more people, not that I would say that, you know, yeah, there are certain people that I think I could learn more from, but just this idea that people are generally good and people are generally pretty smart, um, and I know, like, I just feel like everything right now is very, there's a temptation to, you know, put people in some sort of a group and you kind of pick if you can learn from them or not, you know, whether that's they're Christian or not, or they're Republican or Democrat, or, you know, you just take it from there. But, and I think of the the example that, like, pops into my head first, like, when I kind of think of this idea was our friend Joe, when we were living in, me and Matt, who's not obviously on the podcast tonight, but when we were living in 
our apartment in graduate school, you know, there's me and Matt who are these, you know, supposedly devout Catholic guys and our friend Joe who's not. And I still remember it so distinctly and I bet he for, has forgotten it completely. But it was super hot outside one day and we're probably like playing Super Smash Brothers or something stupid like that. And I I can like picture it. He was like, do you guys want this cup? And we we're like, no, like, I don't, it's a plastic cup. It probably said Bradley Braves and it was free at one of our whatever events. And he left then. And like, he went and he took water to the, the, um, the dude that was getting paid to mow the lawn of like our apartment complex. He just took him a cup of water. And I just remember thinking like, and I, I don't know, it sounds super simple, I guess, but like it struck me so much that, you know, I feel like I learned more about caring for the, the needy from that instance than from insert whatever book I'd read about caring for the needy, you know, if that makes sense. Um, and this was the first one. And I think the other thing, and honestly, I did not think of this until Mike shared his story, but I feel like it's worth sharing just this idea of just of death in general. So I was very close to my grandma when she passed away pretty much because she died in a hospital during COVID. So, no one was allowed to visit even her like last hours comfort at like comfort care. Two of her four children were allowed to visit for three hours and that was it. And then they had to leave. So like they weren't allowed to stay till the very end and her other two children weren't allowed to get in, which just awful. But in the week leading up to that, I worked in the hospital. So I was really one of my cousin did too. So like we're the really the only people that I got to be around her. And I feel like, I don't know, it's hard to even put it into words, but I feel like just the idea of death became much more real and tangible to me because I actually had to see it like happening. And in some ways, like I felt like I kind of had to take on the role of the, the family member who was there because my other family members literally weren't allowed to be. But to tie it into the question of, you know, what has experience taught me? And I don't even know if I have like the right words to say like what it taught me, but just I feel like I learned more about just death in that week, just seeing someone die, this process of death that I, I, there's no other, like I could not have learned, like seeing, you can't learn that without seeing it happen firsthand. At the start, I was like, oh, I'm going to choose a job or a marriage story. Um, <clears throat> hearing you both talk, I feel like maybe I've hit those two and, um, speaking about what we've learned it seemed yeah learned from our faith between book knowledge and experiences um my <clears throat> head just got to thinking about uh i think having lived through marriage and job experiences and grappling with what our faith means in a modern world and how to understand, um, yeah, the word, the Bible and the junctures, which we choose left or right or straight. I think that just having had the ability to, walk 30 almost 35 years on this earth I, I think the appreciation of living that and um, understanding the value of the stories in the Bible and the gospel and what what Christ directs us to you know, turn our hearts to is, is something that I felt like I knew at 14 or 15 as book knowledge, but having experienced a couple more decades, it's like even more unknown and mysterious and just a thirst to pursue. Um, yeah, and that's, I felt like,
that's changed a lot and has been a refreshing thing. Yeah. All right. So where we, let's see, it's either Matt or Landon. Matt's not here. Landon, do you have anything? Where are we going next? Definitely done research. Don't have anything to call today. So stay tuned for another Oscar nominated movie and a great speech within it. Yes. Thanks for drinking. And thinking. With us. Hey, be safe out there, will ya? Talk to y'all later. <laughs> Cue the music. Dead ends come and go. Look toward the horizon. Up ahead you'll find a peace of mind. Relief from the trying. I had burned a bridge, wrecked in a ditch, had to ask forgiveness. Dead ends come and go, look toward the horizon. Oh, there are stories to tell, the times we grew and the times we fell. Recording Thursday. now. This is Thursday. Recording And now. Mike has a story about his first flat tire. <laughs> so The Honda years, chapter I get, 17. I get a little something. <laughs> I get a little something in my tire and pull into the Freemason parking lot, as previously described. And I've got one of these stupid jacks that Honda makes that is just like the goofiest little thing. I'm I'm jacking around with this thing, no pun intended. And I can't get this I can't get this handle to turn cuz it's one of those things where it's like the um what what the heck is the thing called that turns the the lug nuts? <laughs> wrench. The wrench, the lug wrench. <laughs> lug wrench. And I can't get a thing to turn completely because I have it in such a position that it's just hitting the asphalt before it can even turn a full revolution or anything. So anyway, I jog it around. I get into a spot where it works, blah, blah, blah. I get the tire off and I get the spare tire on and my spare tire is flat. So I go on down to some other houses Luckily, I was just in town here, so I knocked on a few doors. No one answered. Then I see a girl who is staring at me down the street. And so I run down the sidewalk, down Main Street, carrying my tire. And I say, hey, 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 hey. (laughs) And I'm like, hey, sorry, sorry, Mike. I got got a flat tire. And she's like, yeah, some kids have been smoking weed there this week. That's why I was watching you. And so I said, oh, well, do you have a pump in your garage or something? He's like, no. I'm like, well, what if I give you a few bucks and you go down to Philip 66 and fill up my tire? And she's like, or I, and she hesitated. I was like, well, or I could go with you. And she's like, okay. Which was sort of surprising, <laughs> like random man I just met 30 seconds ago. Was she ago. dialing 911 like in their phone behind her back <laughs> at this moment? <laughs> So we exchange names, Megan and Mike, and drive down to Phillips, get my tire filled up, and I ask if she I can get her anything. She says, a Red Bull. And so I get her two, and I say, you're not going to drink these tonight, are you? And she says, nope, I have to wake up at 4.30 tomorrow for work. And I say, like, oh, okay. So then we just talk about what she studied, what she did. And it was just a very pleasant exchange. And I sent her on her way. I didn't even suggest the speech, guys. <laughs> because I, I considered it. But 